Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of what goes wrong with Justin's tech as he's trying to live stream, which has like been the occurring reoccurring theme of the past like three. Like I had weird tech stuff with Dr. Svitza last week in Cleveland, the tech failed. Yesterday with uh, Angela, the power went out. The the forces of Citra Acha are really you know, but they say that the, the, they attack you more if you're righteous, but that's totally not the case in, in my case. Zevi, welcome back, brother. Good to be with you, Justin. They're catching on to you, the, the evil forces. They're hot in your trail. Uh, something, man. Something. Um, all right, folks. So welcome back to our, our sixth sixth installment studying the Yanuka. Um, we're, 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 we're getting, we're in the in the thick of it, in the, in the battle of the Torah. Um Zevi, any reflections from last time? It was some pretty, pretty beautiful, pretty, uh, pretty lovely stuff last time. I think we're not going to repeat that this time. It's going to get kind of ugly, but <laughs> yeah. um, any reflections from last time? Yeah, we're definitely about to change tone and gears here. Yeah. Last time was really, was really splendid. It felt to me like a very climactic part of the text and, and the, this narrative that we've been painting out here. It was a, it seemed like a point where, the boundaries between the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial, the the mundane and the metaphysical, was rent asunder, and and we saw that that crack open in the text. Um, yeah, it was interesting building up towards that, and now I think we're going to see a bit of a come down from it, and uh, we we're here for the journey wherever wherever the Yanuka takes us. That's right. Yeah, I, I get the same uh, the same feeling, right? There's sort of like. Uh... There's that moment where like we go above the clouds and it's all light and beauty and now we're going to plunge right back into mm -hmm. the depths mm -hmm. and that's that's sort of like i think the, the 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 narrative arc of the zohar kind of does that to you right it wants you to ascend to the great heights to get a taste of all of uh all that the divine has to offer and all of its beauty but also you know the the real task is not that the real task is to get down into the depths of the mm -hmm. the really uh the really bad stuff and, and redeem it and so on the one hand, last week is sort of a uh, chazak chazak. It gives us a little bit of strength through beauty so that we can uh, dive down, I think, into these more uh, gross sections. Um, and we can talk about them more. But yeah, uh, I think that's uh, the Zohar's kind of uh, leading, leaving, leaving, leading us on. But yeah, also just thanks for everyone in the, in the chat who's joining us this morning for some Zohar study and the folks who join us later. Um, I'm just really... I don't know how you feel, Zebby, but I just am so stoked that, you know, dozens of people uh, come and hang out every week and learn some so Zohar with us. It's just like uh, makes my makes my Thursdays better. Yeah, my, my one my one and only regret in this context is that we uh, because of, you know, the restrictions of geography and time and space and those stubborn illusions, as Einstein put them, that we can't be doing this in a room together with a live audience and people get to you know, be present and feel their presence and ask questions. That's right. Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll be, we'll have the merit to do that. Um, let's do it. Let's open. Um, so I guess I'll start. Go for it. All right. So we opened the Yanuka is, uh, this is after dinner, right? This is after dinner. Um, they've not said the blessing though, right? They're, they finished eating, but they have, they said the, have they benched yet? Not that we've seen. They've just been lingering at the table. Right, so this is pre some pre benching, some uh, some light after after dinner talk here. <laughs> um, so he opens, uh, saying, "Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this assembly will lick up everything around us as the ox slips up, licks up the grass of the field." I love that image. Mm. Uh, Moab said to the elders of Midian, right? So Moab said to the elders of Midian, "It is not written the elders of Moab said to the elders of Midian, but rather Moab said." So the Zohar is indicating that because it says Moab said uh, it must not be elders because uh, otherwise it would have been the elders of Midian said to the elders of Moab, but they're indicating here that it was not the elder. It was the young people, right? The young took advice from the elders and the elders were drawn to them and gave them advice. What advice do they give? Evil advice they took for themselves. So this is interesting. I, I, I want to stop here because I think that there's something interesting in about the dialectic here. Mm. One, there's a, a, a real question of responsibility, all right? That when young people come to elders asking for advice, uh, that's a that's a heavy thing. Mm. And the advice that the elders allegedly give here is evil advice. Mm. And just this just sort of the 
one of the lessons to be learned here is that when you know you talk to young people, um, you know, what advice you give is very, very prescient. And I yeah. like this idea because I think about this as a parent that being a parent is one of the one of the greatest things about being a parent in my in my um, experience is the opportunity to be the better person because mm. you know that there are younger people watching you and modeling mm. your behavior. Mm. So it's an opportunity to be the better person. Mm. And so when someone asks you advice, don't give it seems like the one of the lessons to be learned here is don't give advice that you think is best. Give the advice that is best. Mm. Um, but notice here, even when you give good advice, even if you do, which we can maybe say here that that uh, that the elders of the media didn't notice evil advice they took for themselves. Mm. Mm. I wonder, right? Like I'd love to look at the Aramaic, but it we don't actually get to hear the advice the Moabite gave them. Mm. The elders of the Moab could have given them good advice, right? But if the Midianites are out to do evil, they'll take evil advice, no matter what advice is given. Evil advice they took for themselves. So what an yeah. interesting, like, you know, like it's interesting that we don't we can assume that the Midianites gave them bad advice, evil advice. Mm. Mm. right but the moabites right they took for themselves so it's interesting that we're there's a responsibility in terms of giving advice but there's also a responsibility in terms of taking advice right right which is which we see here in the text right mm -hmm. that what advice did they give them is the question and the right. answer is evil advice they took for themselves right and right. we <laughs> right uh, and there's and there's also this obfuscation here of it it's actually moab who said to the elders of midian and now and then that kind of gets reversed that it's the that the it's it's there's i think there's a bit of an intentional play here where we're switching out eldest elders for the for the youth mm -hmm. but um but then but then the reception is switched for the giver as well right yeah and the zohar loves to do that switch the elders for the younger right like mm -hmm. it, it'll switch it'll invert father-in-law son-in-law relationship mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that and for that we we know from the talmud it'll often inverse those there's also an interesting parallel that came up for me here to the um to a well-known medrash on on the book of esther on the on the megillah that we read on purim which is in the second chapter the king uh, king achashverish asks for advice um and the advice it says is given to him from the youth very very the love that the nar the children the, the youth in the palace say to him and the medrash points out that the reason why it was the youth giving advice is because all of the advisors in chapter one who had given the advice that that Vashti, the, the, the queen, be killed, were killed when Ahasuerus <laughs> sobered up. So the only people left to give advice were the youth. And the advice which they give is the advice of youth, which is to hold this, you know, extravagant beauty pageant and to round up all of the virgins in the in the country. And uh, and I think we're going to, I think that there might be an intentional um parallelism or, or like hyperlink between here and Esther. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that the advice that they give is also the, the advice of youth in some way, or the advice that was taken right. is the right. advice of youth, right? It's also related to, to, to bringing around beautiful women. That's what the, that's what the youngsters, right. that's, that, that's their idea of good advice. Right. That's a great, uh, that's a great parallel and uh, great timing, right? Like we're you now welcome yes. to Adar everyone. We're in the, yes. uh, we're the we're in the, we're in the month where things should be getting better. Hopefully, we'll get to some more joyful sections in this one. Got it, Billy. Yeah. Uh, so they said to, to Moab, "We have re, we've raised an evil growth in our midst." That's such a terrifying language. An mm. evil growth mm. in our midst. Mm. And who is that? Moses, their master, because of a certain priest, y Yeshai, um, the Midianite that took Moses in, who was amongst us, who trained him, who raised him in his house, and gave him his daughter in marriage. Furthermore, he gave them uh, he gave him money and sent him to Egypt to destroy the whole country, and he and all his household will draw after him. If we uproot the master of theirs from their from his world, his whole people will immediately be uprooted from the world. The whole wicked plan about the affair of uh, of the Baal at Peor came from Midian. So this is this is a interesting kind of temporality, because. The incident of Baal Peor takes place at the very end of the 40-year exile, right? The 40-year mm -hmm. journey in the wilderness. This is like the very last thing that happens before they kind of get ready to cross over. But this is this is sort of happening. The plotting here is happening before Moses even gets to Egypt. Mm. So this is like a plot 40 years in the making, allegedly. Like they're already like plotting 40 years out. You get that sense, Zevi? 
Oh, I, I, I didn't realize whether they were plotting it in advance or in, in retrospect. Right. Like it's like, and it, like he was sent him to Egypt to destroy the whole country and all his health were drawn. Yeah. It just, it seems like, yeah, it's sort of a weird, when is this happening exactly? Hmm. Hmm. Cause it has to obviously be happening before the incident of Balpior. I mean, this whole framework is very interesting. This, it's a really, it's a whole reframing of the narrative, which we're not used to, right? This whole idea that, that Yisrael, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, sent Moses with money as some sort of like mole into destroy Egypt. Right. Um, I, I, I think it makes for a much better story, actually. <laughs> like this is... <laughs> when also it's sort of it, it i mean to modern ears it very much sounds like sort of anti-semitic conspiracy theories right mm, mm, like this mm. really rings as like uh you know that uh the jews are the fifth column you know they're here mm. to they're sent in to, to undermine the... yeah so it has a sort of and one wonders right i mean again, this is a 13th century text one wonders you know the blood libel and those kinds of things are already beginning to emerge mm. one wonders if again i and it, you know i think we said this before we started that um you know, it's it's impossible for me not to read this sections about uh, the non-Jewish enemies of Israel without reading into it the the Spanish context of these texts, mm, sure. where uh, where we're living in sort of a, a nigh to Reconquista period in Spanish history. Um, you know, these are not quite the days of Alfonso the Wise. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, uh, it's an interesting reframing. It's 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 also a very I mean, it's it's a reframing that the authors of the Zohar are doing from the perspective of the enemy, right? So they're they're telling you what the enemy is thinking, right. and it's 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 and in that there's a very subtle. I mean, a lot of war is like soft war, and how do we frame narratives, and how do we and and this framing changes Moses from a freedom fighter who goes to liberate a, uh, a you know <laughs> a, a, a people in slavery marginalized nation to this uh, to this powerful spy with resources who's going to undermine an empire he goes from being essentially a freedom fighter to a terrorist and just right. with, with a few very short words and that also struck me how um the so the, it's this double it's the it's the author of the zohar saying how the story would have been told by the enemy of israel it's like an interesting um yeah it's an interesting double thing there that's great and also do you it is it is interesting i mean does the Torah never says it Jesse ever gave him money? Yes, sir. Or even sent Jeth him. Yeah, yeah, Jethro. Like it, like it never says like. Oh yeah, money, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not as far as I'm aware. No, yeah. it's very, it's it's certainly it like really raises him as this, as like this intentional like, <laughs> like a target missile sent by by Jethro, right, um, right. and that's and again we by the way we had this earlier where we said that Moses was raised in Midian, right, right. Which, which we said at the time that he wasn't. He was raised in Egypt and he leaves as an adult, a mature adult already. But here again, in, in this framing, it's it's clearly this this fictional reframing on behalf of the enemy where he's this product of Midian, like that's kind of t trained under the tutelage of, of Jethro. Um, which is... Right. The, the other thing which, which caught my interest here was, was, and this is very, very typical of the Kabbalists, that for the Kabbalists, the enemies of Israel are very, a very astute... Kabbalists or magicians or metaphysicians themselves like they they're evil but they know what's up right there's this right. this theory of the parallel where it's like that god creates everything <clears throat> like side to side so like the balam is a parallel to moses and then sort of the energies of of good have, have faced off against the energies of, of evil uh or vice versa and over here this point which which they say that if you if we can uproot the master of theirs from the world his whole people will be immediately uprooted from the world is like a very, is like something which <laughs> the Kabbalists would be saying about Moses in reverse, right? Right. They'd of be course. saying that if Moses has power, then the people have power. That Moses is the metaphysical parallel. So, so, and we're going to see this theme continue throughout that the that the enemy of Israel is not an idiot, is not is not is not unaware of the metaphysical workings of reality. They're very aware, but they're using it for their own nefarious purposes, and that we'll see again and again here. Right, and this is clearly we're in Sitra Achra territory. Like, like this is. I think you know, these sections, I think, are are they're kind of redundant on other sections from previous. We've kind of already rehashed this, but the Zohar never stops at an opportunity to, to sort of go <laughs> after, uh, you know, Amalek or Moab or Ammon. Mm -hmm. But also, these are the forces of Sitra Achra. So it's really so, important that uh, when when we're studying these sections, that we're not talking about historical Moabites, like we're talking about, um, you know, you might use the language of archetypes, but or or metaphysical realities. 
yeah. more so yeah. than um, yeah. more so than it's funny because I've been reading about Moabites um, a lot recently, and so it's funny like to read these sections and you know to right. actually listen to it. You know, I've been reading about Moabites and Midianites and yeah, all the Suddenly- ites. Certainly, whoever authored this text at whatever time frame we want to place them never saw a Midianite <laughs> yeah. in their life and, and never had the opportunity. And and as this text will be continuing to be read throughout the centuries, particularly in the Hasidic movement, these are all going to be internalized, um, psychologized, however you want to turn it, where it's where it is the and this is something that applies for everyone. Uh, whoever is reading the text, Jew or non-Jew, is identifying the inner Moabite, the inner Midianite, and that refers to different character defects or different uh traits that one needs to root out from within themselves did you did you have something about the the uh, affair of par that you were that you were going to sh- explain for for us in the audience um i guess we'll, we'll get we'll get more to it in a minute but basically it's just a, a it's a moment where you know the that they the what is the 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 um, the, the mobites basically lure the some some israelites a chunk of them into idolatry but idolatry right on the eve of crossing into the into the uh, the the promised land, which is especially egregious, right? Because mm-hmm. there there's something forgivable about the whole business of the of the ark of the of the uh, the golden calf, right? There's something forgivable about that. Like they had just come out of bondage. They were uh, the way that Maimonides are kind of habituated to you know these kinds of forms of worship, and and so it's forgivable. But there's something about the fact that after ever how many mm-hmm. years of mm-hmm seeing firsthand uh, and then seeing literally with their eyes that they're mm. about to cross over that they would uh, again uh, apostatize so yeah. the incident of Baal Peor is um, I think in the in the Torah and also in the in the uh, in the Zohar somehow especially egregious yeah um, it's especially horrifying that that, yeah. that kind of apostasy could have happened um, and in a way that I think that the Zohar sort of imagines, the golden calf to be a necessary evil the way we talked mm. about earlier mm. but this was a, a kind of evil that was uh, egregious i think it's very interesting and it's it's a theme that you see throughout the you know jewish mystical literature and perhaps even beyond where the forces of evil or or darkness or 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 however it's being phrased will give their final hurrah right before the break of dawn mm. right if anyone's if anyone's stayed up particularly near a coastline right before dawn breaks the coldest part of the night um, and, and the dock is ostensibly is right before a sunbreak. And, and there's a sense, and this is brought down in, in, in Kabbalistic and Hasidic texts that there's like the, the analogy given of two, of two people wrestling in one another and, and the, the force, the, the force of evil, the other wrestler here is going to give their final umph of energy before they're about to be defeated. Um, and that's a particularly treacherous moment because it's that moment of, of transition. It's a liminal stage of leaving from exile to redemption. And that's where the, the Sitrachra is going to try, the, the forces of evil are going to try and rear their ugly heads as it is. Right. And you see that sort of in sort of an apocalyptic idea just with even in, you know, in Christianity, right, with the Antichrist and um, and, and Judaism as well. Yeah, it's or even Islam, right, with Ib, like the, the Iblis and the sort of their version of the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the idea that uh, you grip Titus when you're about to let go. Yeah. Yeah, um, and that's the most that's the hardest moment to uh, to contend with with, with yeah. evil. Yeah, and it's going to be pre- most it's going to be the most re- regrettable in retrospect because of how close they were to tasting redemption. Right, and and for the Kabbalists, that means tasting inner redemption and and whatnot. Yep. Yeah, it's a um, yeah. The incident about about Baal Peor is uh, is like yeah. It's I think one of the it's one of the yeah sort of the great uh, horrors of the of the Torah. Um. So come and see, right? Come and see that everything stemmed from Midian uh, and all their counsel was aimed at Moses. This is one of the things I find also just kind of like cringy about the Zohar is it it never wants to put any responsibility on on the Israelites. <laughs> uh, it's it's always explaining away why they make their mistakes. That's what I think one of the cringy things about the Zohar. Is it's always someone else's fault. It's Midian's fault. Uh, this yeah. whole business of Baal Peor. Right. Um, but where there's a pairing here as well, which is happening, right? Everything stems from, from Midian and all the council Moses. Moses and Midian, we're going to be pairing those two up here. Right. Yep. So on their advice, uh, Balaam was commissioned. Folks may know Balaam was the the prophet who was charged to curse Israel, but ended up blessing them, who actually we know of from non-biblical sources. Uh, Balaam mm. is known. Uh, there is a uh, There was a plaster wall that was discovered uh, that had uh, some of Balaam's prophecy on it. So he was a well-known figure outside of uh, of the Bible. So he's uniquely attested outside of the of the Torah. 
Not bad. Um, yeah, they got, so, their, they got their money's worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He he really was. Uh, he was a, he was a man about town. Uh, Dear Allah, I think is where the where the plaster was found. Hmm. On their advice, Balam was commissioned. As soon as they saw Balam, uh, Balam, they could not prevail. They adopted another evil plan. Right. Um, it's interesting. It's that they said as soon as they saw Balam, they no. They, as soon as they saw that Balam could not prevail. No, they saw the, yeah. As soon as they saw that Balam could not prevail, right, they right. adopted another plan. Um, and so they prostituted their wives and daughters even more than Moab did. Um, for of the Midianite women, it is written, look, uh, these are those who, by Balaam's word, led the children of Israel to betray Yoke Vavke in the affair of the Baal of Peor. Everything stemmed from Midian. So, uh, again, they're kind of like, they're just like, if you weren't sure about it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, just to repeat it. Yeah. Um, um, but it's interesting, again, they kind of have tabs on Balaam, right? Mm. That they kind of like are watching from a distance, which mm. is a sense you don't get um uh, you don't get uh like you don't really get that from the sense from the torah right but mm -hmm. balaam is mm -hmm. sort of an independent agent in the torah but you don't get the sense that he's like he's just basically an agent sent by uh sent by them um also folks may know this that uh the 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 mouth of the donkey of balaam is one of the 10 things created um at the eve of the first shabbat uh, i love all the weird the 10 things get created the tongs are my favorite Mm. Uh, the primordial tongs, but uh, the yes. voice of Balaam's donkey was also created then. Yes. Which also, you get the sense that, like, that God is kind of planned it all out. Like, right, right. But, like, right. The, it's already a done deal. Yeah. Uh, I'll finish this paragraph and then we'll, we'll jump over. So they conspired with their chieftain that he should prostitute his daughter. All right. Wait, what did you think of this transition from uh, this? First, we'll try magic, then we'll try sex. What did you? think of that they should have tried sex first <laughs> just skip, <laughs> skip right ahead yeah i mean uh i mean i i've been around some dudes i happen <laughs> to be one um i'm not that i'm not that seduced by prophets but uh i've heard lots of things about these moabite ladies um yeah you get the sense that again like um uh, that it's sort of writing this in zohar language that um you know, the, the text is a very embodied text, right? Mm, like Balaam mm. at some level is kind of working kind of a prophetic kind of thing, but the Zohar is a very embodied text. It's a very sex powerful text and yep. therefore uh, sex, right? Like, and there's something about illicit sex for the Zohar too. That's especially um, whether it's masturbation or, or fornication or whatever, there's something about illicit sex that the Zohar finds especially powerful because sex is so powerful for the Zohar. Right. Obviously, um, uh, illicit sex somehow would be e even more powerful right that, right uh, prophecy prophecy i mean netzach and hod who, who cares about netzach and hod right we never like right right and they're associated typically with prophecy but it's right. sex that has uh, so does real netzach. guns i think for the for the zohar that's a great formulation by the way i'm going to use that in the future if you don't mind that it's not it's not sex negative or sex positive it's sex powerful yeah that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it's yeah, because it's again, the Lord's all about how you use this stuff, right? Right. And for the forces of Moab and, and Midian, it's going to be negative, but um, right. but it's, again, it's all about how sex gets deployed, and I think that's why sex is more powerful than prophecy for the Zohar, just because of how powerful sex is for the Zohar. Hmm. Um. Yeah. So they conspired with their chieftain that he should prostitute his own daughter. Right. This is how. Again, this is a sort of. Uh, you know the horror of of uh, illicit sexual relationships, um, and it gives a sense of like, in the way that the Hieros Gamos is very consensual in the in the body of the Sfirot. There's something about like it's so the the way that Israel and the Sfirot relationship is so much. It's related to like it's so much about uh, flirting and seducing mm. and mm. enticing and arousing. Mm. Right, there's something very uh, uh, flirtatious around mm -hmm. how the Zohar mm -hmm. operates in mm -hmm. terms of like licit sex, mm -hmm. uh, which is still highly erotic. Um, notice how this is not erotic at all. Mm. It's just force. Like he's forcing her, her his daughter into uh, this sort of sexual snare with Moses, and that's again the, I think the difference between uh, er the eroticism of the Hieros Gamos and the Sfirot versus the way that it's composed in Sitra Akra, where it's just compulsion. Mm -hmm. There's something very horrifying about the about the uh, the way that the the chieftain uh, is relating to his own daughter here. That right. that uh, 
that Hashem and you know the way that Tif Tiferet and Yesod relate is a very like erotic relationship, but it's never force. Here, the relationship is pure force. Hmm. It's very it's very tactical and utilitarian and pragmatic and That's right. uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's it's a very um, yeah, it's it's a yeah, like tactical is a you know it's tactical deployment of eroticism, yeah. whereas yeah. Yeah. Uh, the eroticism of the of the Zohar is very uh, uh, it's all about jouissance, right? It's all about this sort of uh, overpowering uh, thing. Mm. Um, so again, we have two different conceptions of of how sex occurs. With many kinds of charms, they adorned her so that their leader would be caught. And the, but the Blessed Holy One turns sages back. Again, you get the sense of like she's just being bedecked. Mm. She's not. She has no consent in this process. She's just being mm. adorned. You get the sense of like they're hanging jewels mm. and magical mm. amulets upon her uh, in this really horrifying way. It's interesting. I saw a parallel here back to earlier, if you don't mind me just jumping in here a second. Please. That that the Shekhinah, as she descends mm. through the various stages, she is adorned with all and, and I think we see here, and this this we're gonna see a lot of the direct parallel between the holy and the and the profane or the holy and the evil, where where they're both adorned, right? But one of them is an act of love and arousal and desire. And and here it's here it's again as you're saying it almost seems like it's it's shoved on her yeah. so it's it's the exact same thing happening mm -hmm. just just flipped that's a great that's a great point yeah I totally agree um, yeah yeah that's that's something and also like the kind of charms that she's getting you get the sense that they're you know again like there's double non consent here right that if they are magical charms she's being forced to wear them and the love the eroticism that would be aroused would not be mm -hmm because of Moses mm. consenting to it. He'd right. be tricked into, into right. this, into, into this relationship. Right. So it's doubly compulsive, um, in, 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 a, in a really dreadful way. Yeah. So they foresaw that the leader would be caught in their net, but they didn't understand. So, uh, God is going to laugh last, of course. So we'll laugh best. Uh, but again, also I like the fact here, right, that there will be a leader trap, but it won't be Moses. Yeah. Sitra Akra still gets its peace. Right, that God, clearly God's planned all this. God knows what's about to happen, but rather than simply the plan falling flat the way it did with Balaam, mm. right, Sitra Akra still gets something, in a way. Hmm. And the, again, the 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 the, the constant motif or the alter motif or the Zohar of the giving the devil its due, I think, gets played out here. Interesting, interesting that you're seeing that here. Interesting. So they saw, yet they did not see. Right. So we get two conceptions of of of, of seeing. They saw the leader of the people falling with her, along with many thousands of others, and they thought, ah, that was Moses. So they prostituted her, right, Inclu instructing her about Moses, saying, couple only with him. Um, so uh, she said to them, how will I know who Moses is? And they replied, the one, the one whom before you see everyone rising, couple with him and no one else. So when Zimri, son of Salu, appeared, this is um, one of the Simeonites, um, 24,000 members of the tribe of Simeon rose before him since he was their chieftain, so she thought he was Moses. And she coupled with him. When all others saw this, they, um, that they, they did what they did, and what happened, happened. I love how uh, the, the Zohar is chas right. Like It doesn't... Uh, right. It's so horrible. <laughs> it, uh um they did what they did and what happened happened there's something, as it was was and what happened happened yep uh there's that there's something uh so this is something so I'm oh and also it. right uh it's worth mentioning i think they mentioned his right that uh the 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 woman that couples with him his name is cosby mm. um and the name cosby is uh, from the root which means to lie mm. right mm. Uh, mm. the rabbis love to pun on kochba mm -hmm. and cosiba mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, son of a star versus son of a liar, mm -hmm. the false mm -hmm. pretender. But uh, mm -hmm. Cosby, right? Um, that again, we're dealing with like, you know, like you said, archetypes are are these uh, more metaphysical things that she that there's something purely deceptive about her seduction, mm -hmm. right. right? And that again is sort of very opposite of the way Shechina and uh, and the way Shechina is, is aroused is through uh, openness, is through light, mm -hmm. is through clarity, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. Cosby uh, is, mm -hmm. is is a lie. No relation to Bill Cosby, we should we should say. Well, I think it may be a relation actually. <laughs> yeah, right. um, a kind of really, really uh, you no know? familial. Right. Yeah, uh, if, if we're writing a modern Zohar, Cosby and Cosby might. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. uh, we we um, don't read Cosby. <laughs> I'll take right. 
Don't read X, rather Y. Yeah. Um, there's a couple interesting things going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be worth it just to take it back down from the top a little. This this notion of of they see but they do not see chazi v'lei chazi that there's this notion that that the evil can see but it's like through a glass darkly. So they they saw something, they saw that it was it was the leader and they thought it was Moses. And then she sees a leader and she thinks it's there's this this double level of of again of obfuscation mm -hmm. and. Uh, of, of darkness that the evil is trying to peer through and they, they did see they had a vision and it's i mean this this i think this very clearly parallels the a few there's a lot of parallels being drawn here to to many midrashim around the the corpus one is to the the magicians of egypt seeing that a leader would rise from israel to redeem them and which spurs on pharaoh's attempt to drown all of the all the all the um all the male children in the in the nile um, this sense of of trying to thwart the people and trying to thwart Moses, but not really seeing and and getting getting confused along the way, and those midrashim around Moses, I think, are being evoked here as well. Um, in the in the Zohar is really about sight, right? That mm. you know, come and see. Tachaze, mm. like it, the fact that they that they you know, then they said right, uh, the opening of the section was come and see, and that idea that you know we see and they don't, right? Uh, that's like. Uh, again, the 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 way that the the way that sight is being conceived, uh, and who sees and who doesn't, some very gnostic -y kind of um, right, right. So uh, some gnostic -y kind of uh, connotations. Um, also, this whole language of of how will I know that she's trying to figure out who she needs to be. Firstly, I mean, there's there seems to be a direct parallel between Moses being sent by Jethro on his mission to Egypt and and Kazi being sent on on her mission. There's this parallel. Again, but this this whole how will I know? Um, I was I was I was I was this was bugging me when I was reading the text the first time because I knew that there was some really strong parallel here to somewhere else in the Jewish corpus. Um, in this in this question of how will I know and the response of oh well you see someone for who the people are standing and that is and I had a couple near near hits but I I didn't it's still bugging me and I don't it's not res being resolved for me is this is there any hits to, to to other narratives that are that are coming up for you with this question and answer of hers about standing of of how how will i know who to seduce and and i was thinking of the story of of Yehuda and tamar the story of esther and Achishverish, like a couple different sexual relations that are unclear about who the target is and how to be identified were coming up for me but but i or or uh, there's a uh, Yehudas in the in the in the hanukkah story but none of them really hit the spot for me no, I don't. I can't think of any, any particular, any particular things. No, nothing jumps out to me. I mean, the imagery of, of standing also has sort of yesod energy, hmm. right? Right. That there's right. The, the that that strikes me as like yesod language. Right. The, the the standing up, the being erect. Right. Um, the the closest no. I got was was Achishverosh who who, uh, who stands up his his scepter to 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 Esther when she comes in, mm. and there's also that language of um, of how will I know if it was it was for this purpose that you were put into this question of how will I know around sexuality? There's there's sort of this immense power in this. I mean, we can read Cosby also here as a vulnerable character. Right. Sure. Sure. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I definitely read her that way. I don't. She's being coerced into into this coercive activity, and she's being she's being she's being weaponized. Her sexuality is being weaponized here. Oh, right. is, is, is what's happening, and and she's and and there's there's the sense of she's afraid. She doesn't know she's being sent off, and who knows how old she is at the time? She could be for you know for the standard of the day, she could have been a, a very young woman, if that. Uh, and the sense of her asking how I know it's it's almost like this this very scared woman child, not knowing where she's being sent to, which man she's being sent to. Um, there's, there's some, this fear here, there's some pathos here that I'm, that I'm reading too. Yeah. And the parallel with the Yanuka, right? That this is a, a young right. boy telling a story right. about a young woman, right. uh, girl, you know, a boy and a girl. Also, there's right. the sad irony of how Cosby will die, right? Yeah. Uh, there's something about yeah. the, the erection of, of, uh, of Zimri standing up and mm. that, uh, that, 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 that sh they both will be pierced through with a spear. There's right, the, the, another phallic the, object, yeah. yeah, another phallic object, and and very yeah. pierced through the body, and yeah, very, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so you, I think that, yeah, the, the 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 Zohar really, I think, is there's something about this sort of erection stuff that's going on, right? Um, that you're that that they're they're really uh, 
putting on. But yeah, and you get the a- sense of like you know again like like you said with Cosby, you you don't want to uh, you don't want to blame her, right? Um, but she's still like again, it's like a child soldier, so, you know, but still right. part of the chakra. Right. Um, and of course, her 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 ending is is a uh, is a you know of course a dreadful one. Right. It's there. There is there is also a perhaps another reading which is just occurring to me now of um, there's a discussion in the Talmud which got picked up by the Kabbalists, of course, of of the the sexual heroism or, or sexual valor performed by different women in Jewish history, uh, and there's a contrast made between uh, Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And um, and you heard it in the in the in the Hanukkah story who murders the the um, um, the what's his name the the, the Seleucid general right um, and or and the sense, yeah El as well right there's yeah. a sense where and 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 the Talmud has this whole discussion of whose sexuality was more meritorious um, and there's a sense again here of this theme which which is going to be re- replete throughout the Zohar of that, that the evil and the good are directly right. juxtaposed. So the sense of, of Cosby heading into the into the Jewish camp to try to take down the leader and um and and Yael and 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 Yehuda heading in to take down the enemy. Um, and in those stories, what we see from 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 memory, we see a much more assertive and brave woman figure where Yehuda goes into the camp knowing exactly who she's going for and she goes prepared with a plan um maybe that's an interesting maybe there's a feminist reading to do here of the empowerment of of the feminine on on the on the on the sacred versus the ex- versus the exploitation on the on the on the evil side p- perhaps yeah yeah and, and yeah with the the tent post and um and pinchas with the spear i mean it's right it's, right it's, uh, right um, not right. that there's many ways to dispatch people in the ancient world, but <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the fifth the, rib is the, the, is a classic for the for the biblical. Yeah, the tent classes. the tent stake is just like that Oof. that image. Oof. Oof. Um, yeah, you want to pick up? Sure. After what happened, what happened. So what happened happened. What was was was, as they say here. Mm-hmm. Everything stemming from Midian in various ways, and therefore Midian was punished. The Holy Blessed One said to Moses, wreck the vengeance of the children of Israel upon the Midianites. Numbers 31.2. For you, it is fitting. For you, it is appropriate. For you, here referring to Moses, as we will see shortly. As for Moab, I will defer them until two pearls issue from them. It is David, son of Jesse, David ben Yishai, who will wreck vengeance upon Moab, washing out the pot full of filth, as it is written, Moab is my wasp is my wash basin. Psalm sixty ten, surely. Uh, until those two pearls issue, Moab was not punished. As soon as they did, David came and washed the filth out of the pot. All of them were punished. Uh, David, sorry, Moab in the days of Moses and Moab, Midian in the days of Moses, and Moab in the days of David. So this is a theme that we saw earlier of of that God will not destroy. The nation uh, until the time uh, that they produce the, the the positive spark that is that is hidden in their very thick and coarse husks, um, and we've it's interesting we've been we've been jumping around with different metaphors to describe the same thing. We had um, we had a fig tree earlier. Um, we had we had um, we had wheat. I think the second time, maybe, and this if this is right, that is the third time. We now have pearls inside of a, a filthy wash basin. Very very um, kind of classic um, vitriolic uh, imagery uh, for people that the, that the authors certainly don't like. Um, the sense of the, the pearl and the clam. Um, what do you what do you what do you see here, Justin? Yeah, it's you know it's sort of repeating what you said, and uh, but at the same time, I mean, even though this language is very uh, you know xenophobic and and worrying in that way. Um, there's not pure evil here, right? Like the Zohar doesn't mm. really deal in uh, in pure evil. The idea is that um, that the, the even these nations that the Zohar views as as evil still produce not just good but decisively good, right? Right? Like Pearls. you know, with it's David, right? David's like right. The, the the entire world will be redeemed through that line, mm. and I think that that's an important. Um, it's not just pearls in the wash bin; it's the very root of redemption comes yeah. from yeah. from from Moab. Yeah. And so I think that there's a point to be made about that um 
and again, this is to the point of Sitra Akhar, right? That there's something about, uh, and this, you know, in later Kabbalah gets developed by, by um, uh, Chaim Vital and other people uh, that the soul of the Messiah is sunk yeah. the deepest into yeah. the world of Sitra Akhar. And it's only because of um, the, the sunkness of Mashiach's soul that it's able to emerge. Yeah. And I think that that, that, that imagery of, um, you know, the wash, the wash bin full of filth yeah, like Moab and Midian are bad, but it's only from them that redemption comes. Midian from Moses, from Moab comes the Mashiach. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really really fascinating theme, and there's been there's been a lot explored there. It's interesting that we haven't made that point explicit here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very much between the lines throughout, uh, and there's many many different reasons and explanations given why that's the case. Why why all of the um, the lineage of, of of the Jewish Messiah comes through through the, the most evil and also the most um, sexually promiscuous narratives in the Bible, right? It's as we said, it's the stories of of Lot and his daughters. It's the story of Yehuda and Tamar, which gives birth to to parrots, which is going to be also progenitor of the Messiah. It's that all of them. I mean, there's this classic explanation is given uh, that the Sitra Achra uh, is is has its God up so high against the soul of the Messiah, the only way it can slip into into our terrestrial realm is through the most illicit places where the Sitra Achra won't care to check and look. Mm -hmm. All kinds of interesting ideas, but but I think there's some more profound psychological readings, perhaps than just the metaphysical. And, and we may those there may be those may be somewhat obvious for someone who gives it some attention. Tachazi, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. come and see the wicked of Midian. We're about to do some show and tell. For despite all this, they did not subside from all their evil. Generations later, when they saw, again seeing, that Joshua had died along with all those elders who were worthy to have miracles performed by them, they said, now the time is ripe for us. What did they do? What did the Midianites do? They approached Amalek saying, you should remember what the Israelites and Moses, their master and Joshua, his disciples did to you, annihilating you from the world. Uh, which is such a great expression because for anyone that knows the place that that Amalek has in, in Jewish thought and law, uh, the obligation is for the Jew to remember Amalek. And here the Midianite is telling the Amalek, you should remember what the Israelites did to you. It's the exact reversal to what, uh, remember to what Amalek did to you uh, when you were in the desert, when they attacked you on the way. So this is a great, a great reversal. Clearly <laughs> being written by a Jew, that's very clear. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, annihilating you from the world, which is also a funny expression, because if they were annihilating you from the world, then there would be no one to talk to, but uh, attempting to annihilate you from the world, let's say. Uh, now it is the time. Now, now is the time for they have no one to protect them, and we are with you. Uh, so this theme, again, that they, they, they understand full well that when, with, that when Joshua, Moses, and the elders are gone, that their protection is gone, the, the Israelites' protection is gone. This is, again, the, the, the enemy of Israel knowing full well the metaphysics of, of Israel at play. Uh, and we are with you, we're, we're here to support you, which, which is the fear of Pharaoh, you know, that people would gang up and, and we're here. Immediately, Midian and Amalek and the Easterners came up and raided them. Because of Midian, as a result, uh, the book of Judges tells us, the children of Israel made themselves the dugouts that are in the mountains, um, namely that they had to run away from the face of their assailants. There was no one in the world who, who, perpet who perpetrated evil as utterly as Midian. Um, and if anyone reads this, if anyone that knows a bit of, is anyone who's literate in Judaism, there's a question which immediately pops up to them, and the text uh, asks that question for us. If you say Amalek, who, uh, if you if you ask any Jew on the street today, who is the most evil nation of on the face of the earth, they'll tell you Amalek. Um, and here we're saying no Midian, and and so therefore the Zohar, the Yunoka asks, and if you say Amalek, well Amalek because of jealousy for the covenant, for they accosted the supernal covenant, the sphera yisod, so the holy one vents eternal jealousy that will never be forgotten. So there's a specific uh, animosity and, and lack of forgetfulness applied to Amalek, but who is actually uh, the greater perpetrator of evil according to the Yenuka, according to the Zohar, which is a very non-standard Jewish opinion, we should say it is Midian rather than Amalek. Right. For those who see and those who see not enough, right? Most mm. of the Jews in the street would say Amalek, but the mm. real it's Midian, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. It's like those who those who see but don't see enough. Right, right. They're, it's, the, they're, it's the brains behind the the thing. That's, pulling the that's, strings. That's, yeah, right. That's why the Midian is is um, 
Um, but Amalek earned a specific, you know, a specific punishment because of, um, um, right. And the, the Matt tells us, right. That, uh, that they earned this because, uh, allegedly they, they, uh, castrated Israelites and threw their penises into the air, uh, which was a, a direct, uh, a direct, uh, affront to Yesod, right. It's a, it's a, def- it's a, it's mocking Yesod. Right. Right. So, right. Right. Obviously because the, the, the place of the of the of the sign of the covenant uh, is there, and it's it's a it's it's a it's a saying. It's basically telling God, uh, "Look, your covenant is meaningless," and and here it is, um, and and therefore the covenant um, is will not be forgotten. Uh, and 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 the 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 uh, the chavraya, the the companions respond to the Yenuka, uh They said, "Certainly, so there is no doubt in the world." Uh, no doubt, no diggity, no doubt. Which is which is which is well put here because part of the uh, the function of a malik um, in Jewish thought is the cause of doubt, right? So and so them saying no doubt um, seems to be on point. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because again, like if you ask a Jew on the street about the evil nation, they'll say Amalek, and it's funny yeah. they say there's no doubt. Of course, there's doubt. Right. Like, like the Zohar is this is a innovation of Torah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it's um. There is something, yeah. There's some. There's there's a few ways we could read this. No doubt, it's either them trying to to play, to to not be fronted by the Yunoka and not be and be like, yeah, of course we knew this, we, right? Or, or uh, yeah, there's there's probably a few different ways to to read that. No doubt, because it certainly is doubtful, as you're saying. Right. Um, and again, the the phrase of annihilating them from the world, because you, you know the sense is that obviously they're not annihilated from the world, but also yeah. there's a sense that Amalek still exists. There's still like the obligation to destroy Amalek is a is a forever obligation, right? Um, although although it does become spiritualized right, at a point absolutely. in history, yeah. Which is the eradication of doubt, essentially. Mm-hmm. Let me pick up. Are you going to no, keep going? No doubt. Um, yeah, that, that's a nice section. Why don't you take? Why don't you continue? All right. He opened saying, "Yovke Vovke said to me, do not attack Moab and do not provoke them to war.' We've talked about this section." Uh, as it's written, you will uh, approach opposite the Ammonites. Do not attack them and do not provoke them. The Zohar makes a big deal about that. The, the lack of the phrase lamilchama, right, uh, mm-hmm. to war, how it's yeah. absent there and uh, the, the ammunition toward the Ammonites. Um, um, didn't we know until now that the Holy Blessed One was speaking with Moses and with no one else, right? So the obligation here is to Moses, not to, not to anyone else. Uh, why is it written that Yoke Vovke said to me, well, the, the Blessed Holy One commanded only Moses not to harm Moab, not anyone else. To David, he didn't issue this command, so to me. So he told Moses don't harm Moab, but David can do it, right? Right. And, and David, as in fact, David has the obligation to do it. As in it was already clear from the context of, of the Bible that, that Moses was the one being addressed. So why do we add again that, that God spoke to me, to Moses? And, and making and it clear. That the... Yeah, that the obligation or the restriction is, is only is only to Moses, right. which will which we're going to qualify in a second. Right. So do not attack Moab, even invading the slightest bit across their border, for someone will issue forth from them who will wreak vengeance upon them on behalf of Israel, namely David, who was descended from Ruth the Moabitess. Um, the Zohar revels in the irony, right? That don't destroy them because they'll produce their own destruction. Which right. Is a, right. Which is uh, again, I think that for for the more Hasidic uh, psychologization of these texts, uh, you're your own worst enemy, right? That mm. uh, God mm. doesn't need to destroy you. Mm. You know, you'll produce the right. thing that right. will destroy you. And I think that right. that's a, a lesson a lesson all of us. We're all we're we're all our worst enemy. Um, right. There's also the sense that the that the eradication of the evil can only be fully done when if it, if yeah. it's imploded from within, which is why there's this really strict command. Uh, don't even go the slightest across that border. Right. Like, don't don't touch that. It's going to implode upon itself. Let it just run its time. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great. Yeah. Um, that. Uh, and again, there's something about sort of like. Uh, yeah, like uh, you know, we always hear the the refrain, "Don't immunitize the eschaton," right? That the that uh, trying to force the hand of God to create utopia creates a nightmare, and mm-hmm. so one has a sense that. Uh, you know that you don't force don't force the hand of God in this sense. Yeah, like the what's the, the great refrain from the Song of Songs? Do not arouse nor awaken the love until the time is right. Alta iru, alta iru et ava Right. Uh, and do not provoke them to war. 
All right. All this was commanded to Moses, but to no one else was it permitted. If you say, well, it was permitted to Joshua and those elders who outlived him, right? Because it's not Moses. Not so, for they were members of Moses' court, and what was forbidden to Moses was forbidden to them. It's a stretch of logic, I think, but we'll go with it. Furthermore, those fine pearls had not issued yet, for after all, in the days of the judges, um, Ruth issued, and she was a daughter of Eglon, the king of Moab. Eglon died, killed by Ehud. Another king was appointed, and this and this daughter was uh, of his was orphaned, and she was placed in the home of a guardian in the fields of Moab. Uh, when Elimelech went there, he married her to his son. So there's some midrash stuff going on. They're 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 finishing in some of the stuff that doesn't actually occur in the the book of, um, but in in the book of um, uh, in in the book of Ruth. But um, I guess I mean obviously the the first argument I think is weaker than the second that the pearls hadn't issued yet. Um, I think it's also keen right that Ruth is like Shina in some level, like mm. she's born of a king and also mm. goes into exile. Mm. Like she goes out of her, uh, out of her own homeland. Mm. And so in that way you get, you, I, I think you kind of get, uh, sort of Shina vibes from, mm. from Ruth, the way this is, uh, the way this is articulated that she kind of goes into an exile because her, 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 her because yeah, because of her family's killed. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about that section um, also, there's just like the whole messianic thing, right? That there's kind of a, the, even David has a kingly vibe, right? Going back before he was born, but the kingly mm. vibe, at least for the Zohar, is evil, right? That he he's born from not just an evil nation, but from the king of an evil nation. Right, right. Right, that he has, it really comes that. from like the worst. Right, right. Um, and I think that that, that, that is... Um, Again, you see this again with like a Messiah is born on Tishbav, right? That's yeah. on the saddest, worst day Messiah will emerge. Yeah. Some Messiah emerges from the worst possible, from the Sitra Acher, the deepest part of Sitra Acher, and from this uh, malevolent king. Um, so I think that, the, again, there's the messianic irony is is, is a little thick here and, and, and I think quite beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also not something which you which you know from the text or I think is common knowledge at all. I think it's, it's a rather... Um, obscure rabbinic rabbinic position that Ruth is the daughter of Eglon but but as you're saying as you're saying Justin that it's being done very intentionally to tie the head of holiness to the head of evil to make this one-to-one -one comparison which is very important this the symmetry is is very very important for the Kabbalists and we're seeing that throughout um there it's funny because you mentioned by by Moses and Joshua that it seemed like a stretch of the logic when I and and it, and it is because in the beginning we we say that to me is to exclude anyone else, right? And then it's excluding it's only excluding the very one person who we needed to be excluding, which is David, right? Anyone else can be included in that category of Moses. But on the other hand, there's something quite um, there's something quite beautiful and romantic about that. This 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 such a tight relationship between Moses and Joshua, right? The uh, he's described as the moon to the sun. Um, to of jo as as the moon was to the sun, so was jo shows Joseph to to Moses, Joshua to Moses. Le uh, Yamush he never he never departs from the, from the from the mouth of the tent. Um, and the sense that that when Moses is commanded something, it extends to Joshua. And for the Kabbalists, that's going to be very true because Moses is 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 yes for them a historical figure to some degree, but but more importantly, he's an archetype and he's he's an idea, he's a soul, he's a sphere. And and that soul, the soul of the redeemer, is is going to be reincarnated in Moses and future generations, um, up until today, as far as Kabbalists understand the metaphysics of reality. Um, so 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 yes, maybe a bit of a stretch uh, for the modern reader, but I think in their context it, work, it works out quite fine actually. Right, and again, we're thinking of courts, right? Like, where this is a medieval thinking about uh, a medieval like a, a kingly court, and of course they're all connected. Right, um, and again, it's ironic, right? That Joshua is a military general. That's what his job is basically—to kill people, and so <laughs> he's forbidden from this one. Right, um, right. He kills a lot of other people. <laughs> right, right. Um, but not, not, not this one group of people. It's the the house, the house of Moses. The house of Moses. Yep. Um, yeah, this is also a midrash that I'd never really come across. Uh, the whole business of Eglon. It's like one of these. Midrashim that I had not come across, you know, uh, 
before. The phrase the phrase here in the English is also interesting, and I wonder I wonder I would I'd like to look at the the the, uh, the Aramaic that Eglon died killed by Ehud. He I mean died is died means died and killed is, is two different things <laughs> if we're going to be careful with our language. Right. And I wonder and and knowing Matt as a careful translator, I'm assuming that there's something going on in the Aramaic there as well. And and uh, and I feel like there's there's what to th to be to be to be quite frank, this whole section. Um, and, and particularly this next clause, I didn't fully understand what it was contributing to the flow of the narrative. And uh, and I assume it's going to take a few more readings until that makes itself apparent to me. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of a lot of at least a lot of the things which uh, which are appearing like these mysteries. The question marks are at least at least are beginning to be apparent. What lies behind them? I'm, I'm yet to know. Yeah. And you, you would think that, you know, the, the Zohar would be a little bit more on the the face with the messianic stuff with the symmetry mm -hmm. yeah uh, we're, we're reading between yeah. the lines a lot to dig it out but yeah I mean, maybe it's just a case that it's it's it would be on the face to a real kabbalist it'd be a course like we're talking about david it's messiah like yeah done. but one feels like this would this could be a moment where they're like you know raza de raza like you know they could really milk it and they 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 the text chooses not to in, in a way yeah. that seems obvious and maybe that's why because it seems obvious I mean, it's interesting. That, so there, there, there's a famous, there's some famous research research done on on the Inuka by uh, Ben Aruch, I think his name is pronounced, who looks at the messianic themes amongst others, and we've seen a lot of the messianic themes, right? The, the smelling and judging, but they've all been. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to scan back quickly. I, I, I don't, I can't think of that many that have been made explicitly that they're messianic, but they're, I mean, they're very much just there, just, just not. Did we, did we have explicit messianic? Um, did, was that ever made spelled out for the reader? No, I mean I think in some sections of Zohar it is. I mean like uh, in Midrash Nehan Ilam, the oldest. No, I mean strata. here specifically. I oh mean, no, 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 they never talk about Messiah. I think it's just I think it's just meant to be rubbish in the lines. And maybe that's that, that's a that's a self censorship thing too, right? This this is text is being composed in sort of a Christian world and. You know, Messiah stuff in general, you know, I, I feel like they're not, they're not too on the nose about mm. uh, maybe for, for, uh, for political reasons, but also maybe because it's just like easy. Like you're talking about David, you're talking about, you know, David coming out of this and clearly it's not yeah. David that's important here, right? Not a yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, da yeah, David, David, by, by this point in Jewish history, it's David is, is the King Messiah, David Malka, the Meshach. That's, that's, that, that doesn't even need to be said. Right. right. So maybe it's just, we're, we're mining it out because we're, we're the ones who can't see. Mm. Um, <laughs> seeing and not seeing. Yep. So if you say if you say that uh, Elimelech was con converted her there, no. Rather, she learned all the household customs and the food and the drink before she was converted. Only afterward, when she went with Naomi, did Ruth say, your people is my people and your God is my God. Um, yeah, so if you say Elimelech converted her there, no. Um yeah, I mean, it makes this makes sense, right? Like, you can't convert someone on the spot. Mm. And in fact, no one can convert anyone else, right? It's not like Eli Malik is a bait dean, and it's not like he can convert right. anyone. It's not how right. conversion works, right? Um, but you do get the idea, right? That, um, um, right, that that she's having to, you know, do what all converts do is learn how to be a Jew first, and then mm. take the dunk. Mm. Uh, but she becomes a prototypical convert in this way yeah um but yeah i guess and also in the ruth text it's kind of making out why you know the gaps in the in the relationship of when ruth, ruth shows up to ellie Malach. yeah I'm, I'm i mean i'm struggling to see what this is relevant to to the bigger picture here i mean yes we do this is said in the context of a, of a meal and so food and drink that's appropriate but to the to the Amin Moab story, I'm not. I got to be honest. I don't know. I don't know what this clause is doing here. And, I mean, maybe, uh, there's, maybe there's two things happening, right? Maybe maybe one thing is happening here is that out of Moab will come obviously David, which is mm -hmm. um, Messiah stuff, but also out of Ruth will come the ability of conversion, right? We we think of we think of the Israelites prior to that, with the exception of the 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 mixed multitude, which have a very negative connotation for the rabbis. Sure. We don't have a real sense of conversion of people of redemption going outside hmm. or anyone being able to come into the redemption. 
And so it, it may be one of the things that's happening here is not only is Ruth responsible for the redemption via David, mm. but also she's responsible for the ability of the redemption to spread. And so in that way, mm. her ability, to, her conversion, right? And again, and all the with all the parochial stuff that comes along with that, but her ability to to convert him, right, is is the idea that you know the redemption arc is broader now, right. Right, and you're saying that's further emphasized by the fact that she learned all the household customs, food and drink right. within the context of of this of the of the, the filth of Moab, as we, as as the Zohar has described it. That that it didn't it didn't even need it. It wasn't that. That's that's okay. That thank you. That that helps actually. It, it wasn't it wasn't. So we weren't we weren't allowed to Joshua, let's say, and Moses. We're not allowed to attack the nation. Um, and the redemption as well didn't need to be happening. It didn't need to be triggered or uh, precipitated from the outside. It was from within the evil itself mm -hmm. that she learned the ways of purity and sanctity. And that's that's doubling down on this motif of of the redemption or the, or the, the destruction slash redemption of the evil happening from within and of itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Justin. Yeah, I think that's what I'm. That's kind of what I'm getting from this. And also, again, it just shows, right? Like, think of the lesson here: is that nothing is beyond redemption maybe mm. that um you know that we should be very careful about what we destroy and what we don't right um, what we what we deem beyond redemption because right right who knows where ruth um who knows where ruth is also also i get the sense in terms of lessons that we could take from this that there are some things in life that are not for us to be interfered with there are things there are even evils in our life which are better left to their own devices and left to time itself for them to sort themselves out. And I think that's knowing, knowing which pies to stick our finger into mm -hmm. uh, may also be an, a point of wisdom that, that could be derived from this. Yeah, I think so. Um, and again, also like the sex stuff is still here too with Ruth, right? There's like right. Lur lurking in the background, there's the, the threshing floor, right? So right. I think that there's also like, um, you know, again, like, you get this, you know, the rabbi think of Ruth, uh, Ruth as being somewhat seductive. And so you get the, you get this, you know, Cosby versus Ruth. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's, that's definitely a reading that, 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 that could be made here. Sure. So again, just more, um, more kind of stuff that might be lurking between the lines. Mm. You, you may keep going or you want to pick up with them, huh? Um, I could, I could continue. I, I, I do get the sense that we're sitting, um, <laughs> We're sitting like in a in a kiddie pool with our with our toes in the water, and yeah. and and, and the, all the the behemoths and the beasts and the sharks are all lurking lurking beneath us. And uh, but we got to start somewhere. No, Nama no. issued from amongst the Ammonites in the days of David. Then the Holy Spirit settled upon David and said to him, David, when I measured out the whole world, Israel was Chavel Nachalase, the line of his possession. Deuteronomy twenty three nine. I remembered what Moab did to the line of his possession. So what is written of them, he measured them out, the chavel, with the line. Chavel here meaning line or, or rope. Um, a li little play on the words here because chavel is... Um, nach chavel nachalato is, is the, the line, the rope by which you measure the inheritance of the line that you receive, but also refers to the chain of, um, of, of the, the portion of one's inheritance that binds the Jew and God. Uh, so he measured them out with a line, with a rope, um, with the with that line of God's possession, 2 Samuel 8, 2. The line seized all those that were from that seed. So again, I mean, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here at this point. We're going to be drawing this parallel back and forth between Israel and the enemy of Israel. So Israel, who is called Chavel Nachalato, the portion of, the rope of God's inheritance are going to be the enemy uh, who attacked Israel is going to be counter striked with the chavel, with the line, uh, and what that and we will see now what that means. It is written, We're going to both see and expand this this chavel imagery uh, a little broader. with one full length of the rope, um, and Matt here is translating chavel as line. But uh, but I'm not sure why. It might be a bit more helpful to, to translate it as rope. Um, what is meant by melay ha chavel? I have to say, by the way, we've been 
I, I at least I can speak for myself. I've been somewhat critical of Matt's translation here and there, and I want to I want to pause and just say how grateful I am for the for the enormous enormous generational feat that he's done to translate this text. And any 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 bikurt, any criticism, any word here or there is only is only uh, in the spirit of the of the war between the Anoka and his companions between that we're that we're honored to be here. Uh, with that, with with Daniel Matt as a as as a companion in this wonderful wonderful gift that he's given us, I just, just want to I realized that last time after after we spoke that it may seem that we're that we're being uh, overly critical or ungrateful. God forbid, Fabia. God forbid. We're very very grateful. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, what is meant by Melaya Chevel? By the by the length of this of of the line, the, the fullness of the line of the rope, the one of whom it is written, um, the whole world Melaya is full of his glory, Isaiah 6, 3. He said, this one is to be spared and this one is to be killed and that line sees those who are deserving of death. Therefore, he held that line, that rope, and stretched out the rope for that rope of God's inheritance, God's possession. Um, so Matt's helpful commentary here uh, fills us in to what, what's happening that... Um, and this is a very we have like a, a double or triple wordplay going on here, which is quite which is quite nice. Um, so so chevel the, the the rope of God's possession, referring to the people of Israel, uh, the chavel, the rope with which uh, David measures in Second Samuel measures the 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 enemies, the captured enemies from uh, from the Ammonites, and then he 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 kill he murders uh, two thirds. Uh, of that of that length, if I got that correct, um, and then and so that's the first level of wordplay. The second level is that um, that when we speak about chavel, there's a there's a verse in Isaiah. Sorry, there's a verse in oh, there's a verse in, this in the same chapter rather in Second Samuel. We speak about meloya chavel, the full length of of one line, and and the and the, the Kabbalist is using this word as a jumping pad to another time the word meloya is used, uh, which is a classic rabbinic hermeneutical um, trick, which is the Xera Shava connecting a word here and a word there, even though the context is not the same. Um, and Malay, of course, is Malay Chalar. It's converted the one whom fills all the world with his glory, which is God, but but specifically the Shechina, who is the active filling participant. She is the Malay. She is the fullness of God, which is also a beautiful idea. We think about the Shechina as the woman, uh, the woman, and we and we mentioned before that she's she's full, she's fecund, she's pregnant, in some sense, there's and um, she's and we are the pregnancy. We are the pregnancy of the shechina, uh, for in some in some appropriate imagery, um, and 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 therefore it's and David, who's the Messiah, right, who, which is associated with the sphere of Malchut, which is the which is associated with shechina. It goes from being in this in this double wordplay. What we do is we go from David being the one who is uh, seizing the 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 life of the seed of Ammon to the Shechina herself acting through David um, to, to take these souls, to reap them back uh, to where they're needing to go. So this, there's this word play, which is doing this metaphysical play, which is giving us uh, Shechina as this, as this um, warrior character who's, who's destroying the enemy of Israel, which is not a Shechina that we've seen up until the point in the text here, um, but certainly one of the, the Shechina is a very, very diverse and rich character, and that's certainly within her within her purview. No, that's an excellent excellent read, and it is a really elaborate, beautiful wordplay. Um, where, yeah, it, it's really beautiful, and also it's interesting that it's not David getting to choose who lives and who dies, mm. right? That that at some level that power, at least in this case, is not in his hands. Of course, he murdered lots of other people, but there's a sense in which, like, uh, that because this is at some level part of a, a larger divine plan. It's only Shechina that can actually do the reaping, right? Right. Right. Like it's the it's the it's the uh, it's the the line, right? Uh, it's the it's the line doing the in the line and and that line sees those. Mm, mm. Um, and so I, it's interesting to Ken here that uh, that um, again, who's allowed to kill and who's not, who's allowed not to kill? Right. We had this moment where David uh, is allowed to attack and obviously take the prisoners, but the actual final blow at some level at least of this blow is not able to be committed by him so it's against who who is who who is allowed to kill and who isn't yeah that th th yeah that's an important point that it's that it's really only the hand of god 
um, who can who can do that. And even David, you know, the, the son of that is not the one who does it. There, there is also something which is a bit uncomfortable here, which is about how arbitrary the the. Cho- I mean, there's there's two readings here. One is that it's this predestined thing, and it's the and and where the line falls is the is the the will of Shechina or the will of God. But there's also the sense where it's very arbitrary. It's like this one dies, this one lives. It's a bit it's a bit scary, a bit a bit capricious. We could say. Yeah, yeah, and I and uh, I think that this is well before the days of liberalism. You know, this is not uh, individual rights. This is communal guilt and and sin, uh, right. an idea that we find I think anathema now. But you right. know, even even the Middle Ages, it was still thought right. that right. You know, that uh, guilt uh, guilt and innocence at some level was a could be a communal thing. And right. here, uh, right. for the Ammonites, it, it is. It's not just collective punishment here; it's collective cleansing here. It's, I mean, these are, these are very obviously these are very scary words, and um, and and they could certainly be be used uh, in very very nefarious ways. And and we we must be vigilant that um, that that those readings do not do not uh, be taken in that direction. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the bumpers for that kind of reading is that the Shechina is the one doing the reaping. Uh, you're you know. Again, we can we can read other things about this, but the it's about boundaries, right? Like the Zohar is very clear that it's not David having to. It's not David is not the line. He may draw the line, right. but the right. ultimate act is is in the hands of God. Right. Um, which I think when you're when you're thinking about hurting people, that's a good place. A good rule is like may, this might be the task of God to do this, not me. I heard a very interesting story which which ties in to this idea. There was. Um, during the early debacle um, that broke out in the antagonism to the Hasidic movement, the the the, the antagonist, the literally the Mitnagdim, the opposition, um, there was um, there was there was an attempt to put the leaders of the Hasidic movement in in harem and excommunication, um, and and there was an attempt to there was an attempt to uh, to gather signatures for this excommunication. And excommunication in those days was very serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone was excommunicated, it could mean that they would lose their their livelihood, and they wouldn't be able to support and feed their wife and children. It, it, it could, it could, it was a death sentence, very, very possibly in, in such a traditional and tight knit community. And um, the story goes that that um, Chaim of Valajin, the student, the, the the grand student of the grand leader of the opposition of the the Gona Vilna, uh, was asked to sign the Chirim against the Hasidic leaders, particularly the the Alter Rebbe and some others. And um, and he and he and he refused to sign the harem according to according to this, and uh, and when asked, uh, oh, and then and then he said, but your but your master, your teacher, uh, Elio of Vilna the Gon, uh, he himself is signing the harem, and you you refer to him as the angel of God. Um, Chaim of Velazhen had written a famous approbation, and he refers to him as as Malach Kim, the angel of God, language that we've seen here in the Anukkah. Mm-hmm. and he says, how could you? How could you go against the, you know, the angel of God himself is signing this decree. How could you differ from your master? And, um, and he said a very, very beautiful thing. He said that uh, we see in the biblical story of the, sacrifice of, Ija- of the sacrifice of Isaac that an angel of God is enough for Abraham to put down his knife, but it is God himself who is, who, who is needed for Abraham to pick up the knife. Mm. Uh, and, that's, and that's a very beautiful idea. Yeah, I think that's a good lesson. A good lesson, uh, and a good lesson that even, uh, um, yeah, that's why I don't trust angels. <laughs> uh, they just don't have that authority. Yeah, they, yeah, uh, they're, yeah. Yeah, and um, we're going to see that soon in the Inuka, right? That they, that's right, that they that's right. don't have much on us. That's right. Yeah, they don't have much on us. Uh, I don't I don't see why angels are such a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as for Midian, uh, coming back to, to Midian, now we're talking, uh, switching from Ammon back to Midian. Uh, Gideon destroyed all that seed, uh, not leaving any of those who would have harmed Israel by counsel or in any other way. Against all those whose harm, who harm Israel, the Blessed Holy One retains enmity, wreaking vengeance upon them. But if good is destined to come from them, he delays his anger and wrath until a good emerges into the world. And afterwards, he takes vengeance and executes judgment upon them. Rabbi Elazar said, certainly so. This is the elucidation of the matter. And then the Yanuka said, from here on, uh, companions, Chavraya, prepare weapons of battle in your hands and wage war. <laughs> He's just going to turn it up. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, there's not a, a lot here about uh, Gideon, all, you know, um, although Gideon's not a terribly good character in a lot of ways. I don't, you know, he's not, 
um, he's not that great of a character, but at least in this case, right, he does uh, destroy um, destroy the Midianites. Um, but again, the, the text reminds us uh, that he must wait until um, the goodness comes from them. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's just I'm not getting much out of that aside from it, it's sort of reiterating the same the same point and bringing us to a conclusion around the around the Midianites. Yeah, I mean it's 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 peculiar in in how little it's adding, mm -hmm. and that makes me think that that there actually is something that it's adding that that I'm, that I'm not seeing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing. It's kind of, I mean, it's like, it seems like I said, just sort of patch, packaging up the whole story, right? We have the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Midianites, and they all need to get their fate. And uh, this, is, this yeah. is the fate of the Midianites. What's annoying here, though, is Eliezer's, resp Eliezer's response, rather. He says, certainly so. This is the elucidation of the matter. On the one thing which did not seem very elucidatory at all, like it just seemed like a recap. Uh, so, certainly so. This is the elucidation of the matter. Unless he's talking about like, he, he's just saying that yes this is what we've been saying all along i mean i guess he wraps it up i mean it, right I mean, we, we we with the last section did leave us hanging a little bit before they kind of zigged off to something else so i guess this does button up that whole the whole we've, long digression about the, right. about the ammonites and the moabites and the midianites so maybe this is just finally wrapping this buttoning this section up yeah yeah i'm somewhat i'm somewhat unsatisfied yeah, I mean, um, I, did, I have to admit this. Uh, this whole section was, I don't know. Uh, it's, I mean, there's, uh, you know, both the xenophobia of it is like not palatable, um, but also it just doesn't, you know. Hey, man, like you're the Zohar, drop us some, some deep cuts, and this is just like, you know. And I guess maybe the 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 more messianic reading that we're doing is, uh, I guess, interesting. But again, that's sort of like not in the text. We're kind of reading mm -hmm. it into it. So maybe that kind of elevates it, but maybe it's also we, we we're kind of getting this wavelength, right? We we mm -hmm. had this really <clears throat> high length where we, in the last section we were dealing with, where you, you sort of the high rose gamos, and then we're bound back into the citra achra, right? And then we're about to go back up to the world of the angels. Mm. So maybe there's a kind of a modulation, mm. um, there's a kind of modulatory thing happening in terms of mm. the, the literary format. So maybe that's interesting, mm. but it's um. It's interesting. I, I feel like it's kind of making us work for it a little more. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe it's on us to to try harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, I think that you know, I, I take the I take the lesson that uh, it's God for it's for God to take people's lives and be careful who you think. Be careful what you how you treat your enemies, because redemption may come from them. Yeah, the sense the sense that what seems evil to us may be maybe the breeding ground of something very pure. Mm. Also, the the image of the pearl, we we noticed that the that the metaphors switched throughout. Um, we went through we went from organic metaphors of of figs and and wheat, and now a pearl. A pearl is an interesting one because it's um it's that which forms in the belly of of this of this you know, fairly uninteresting or, or even maybe, maybe unpalatable creature, this bottom dweller, which, which in rabbinic stat and, you know, rabbinic spaces, you know, doesn't, doesn't have much, much going for it. Uh, and yet the pearl is like, is like this, it's like the diamond of the ocean. It's like so pure and white and for the Kabbalist whiteness, uh, is, 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 is metaphysical, right? Uh, Lavan is, is 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 not just I mean purity is, is very real for them in that sense. Um and also it's formed by irritation, right? Mm, that, uh, mm, mm. And also uh whatever clam oysters are trafe. Right, 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 right. 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 There, there, there's something about the there's something about the uncleanliness of the of the animal and the fact that it's it's forged you know, by irritation, right? That the, that the, it's, I think it's a, I think pearls are formed by like a grain of sand and around right, that right, right. they get formed. And I, right. I don't know if the rabbis knew that or didn't know that, but I think that there's something interesting about that Ruth is forged in Citra Achra. And we always get the right. sense that Citra Achra is like the, the dross thrown off in the process of forging metal. Right, right. And in this sense, uh, it's the opposite. Ruth is the pearl thrown off by the dross. 
Mm. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, yeah. That, yes, yes, yes. So there's, yeah. there's, there's lots of, I think we could really push the pearl metaphor in lots of interesting, in, 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 yeah, in a lot of interesting ways. Yeah. That she's, that she's the opposite of Sitra Akhra. Yeah. And I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to turn, you know, a Hasidic eye on this, which is that, um, which is the interiorized reading, which is, there may be elements in our own inner life and inner world which feel to us to be irredeemable. They feel to be our own inner Amon, Midjan, um, Moab, and, and, and we don't need to spell those out. We all know what those things are for us and, and the things that, um, and, and some of those things seem, you know, seem utterly irredeemable and they seem like they alienate us from our best selves, from God, however we want to phrase that. And there's a sense here where it's like, no, it's okay. There's something at play which is bigger than you and, and don't, you don't need to fight it. You don't need to. You don't need to disturb it. It's doing its thing, and you and you'll see. You'll see what what comes of it, and that's um. There's something. There's something quite reassuring and wise in that. I think you're right. Yeah, and there's this you know seeing and not seeing, right? That um, that we may know what those things are, and we may not. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. So mm. I think that uh, be patient with your worst self, mm. because you know redemption. May, it may be the case that not only may, may it come from your worst self, but it may only be able to come from your right, worst self. Right, right. That there's a, again, I think I love the idea in Zohar that um, that the best comes from the worst by necessity. Yes. yes. By by a kind of logical necessity of redemption. And so, yeah, I think that that, that more Hasidic inward reading is, a, is an, uh, again, um, that uh, the thing irritating you inside may be producing a pearl. Mm. Well, there you go. We we wrestled a pearl out of an irritating text. <laughs> <laughs> With God's help, um, yeah. You know, again, uh, I think I think we said this before we went on live that we both found this part to be kind of uh, eh. But yeah, again, uh, the 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 text is that the text is a thing we have to wage war with, and right. when we find it to be right. eh, we need to work harder. Yes, 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 yes. We we don't just come for the fireworks. We come. We come for the for the cleanup, and we come for the preparation, and we come for the, the you know the downtime. It's all it's all part of the part of the life of the text. I I I, I, I thought that we might get until this next natural break, um, and uh, and, and may, this may be a good place to to hold. I'm not sure. What do you think, Justin? I don't know when the next break is. I think the next one is going to be for a while. Yeah, it's going to be all the angel stuff. This might be. A, this might be. I mean, I know we're a bit earlier than time. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe we could take a question or two or something. But this might be a good place to hold. Yeah, I think. Maybe. Yeah, maybe we can open up for some questions if folks have questions. We and we have. We're kind of an hour and a half, an hour twenty in. We usually go for an hour and a half, but I think this is a natural breaking point. Um, yeah, folks. Um, one, I just want to express my extreme <laughs> gratitude of all you know, one hundred and fifty-seven folks in the chat. You know, this is the sixth session of of us uh, going through the Zohar. I just want to really express my deep gratitude for the folks who are coming along for any part of this journey with us. Uh, this is a hard text and, you know, you're watching two guys who are grappling with it. You know, uh, I think one time, Zevi, you, you called yourself a tourist in the, in the Zohar. I would, I love that phrase. I'm very much a, a tourist as well. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, it's like a, you can always tell the people who've never been to New York city because they're looking up. <laughs> um, we're, we're the people looking up in, um, uh, in the Zohar and, uh, we, we, we look like fools. I think some, some of the time, maybe most of the time, but, um, I'm just really glad and really grateful that folks have come along for, for the journey. So thank you. Thank you all. Today. Today. Um, so we have a couple questions. Let's just grab a couple and maybe we'll go to like 10, like a hour and a half hour and a little over an hour and a half. Is that good for you? Yeah. So, layman's question. It's not, there's no layman questions here, folks. Uh, if you're here, you're not in layman's camp. Uh, I want to start learning Kabbalah. I'm fluent in Hebrew. Good for you. Um, would you recommend directly reading the Zohar to do so? Is there another text you would recommend for beginners? Could you believe that just today, apparently, Zevi, you want to break the news about for folks who can read read some Hebrew? I'm I'm not sure what you're referring to. Melila. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I blanked out. Uh, yeah, a good a good friend of a good friend of, of Oz uh, and, and a really world class scholar of Zohar um, and, and world class human and, and mystic in her own right in her own right. Um, professor Dr. Belila Helner Ashad 
I just put out a wonderful, wonderful book length introduction to the Zohar um, called uh, On the Path of the Tree of Life. Uh, Alderich Eitz Chaim, I think, I think was the hero. Um, she did that in collaboration with a wonderful younger scholar, also a friend, acquaintance of mine, Omri Sasha. Um, and the two of them, it's literally just 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 come off the press uh, last Friday. Um, so if you're a Hebrew reader, I highly, highly recommend reading Hoek. It's one which is deeply infused with both the, the, the finest, the scholarship following primarily in the footsteps of, of her teacher, Yehuda Libis, uh, but also with a deep, deep love for the Shechina, for the Zayhar, for, for the Chabura, for, for the Rashbi. Uh, and you'll find both of those very beautifully woven together, as only Melilla does. Um, and for those that don't read Hebrew, we're going to have to wait for the English translation. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you can, if even if you only read English, her book on um, on the uh, Parts of Fim, uh, the, the Idra, uh, right. the Idra or, is an amazing right. book. It is the most difficult section of the Zohar, maybe the most difficult thing written in all Kabbalah. And she just makes it just like a, uh, it's a walk in the park. It's just beautiful. It's it, it's it's a powerful scholarship, but also powerful insight from someone for that takes the text uh, very seriously, both as a text, as literature, but also as as as, as, as spiritual text. Mm. So if you read English, also I'll say this maybe for Zohar. If if you read Hebrew fluently and you want to start studying Zohar, what I would recommend you do actually is folks may know this as or isn't one homo homologous text it's made up of lots of little subsections like the yanuka one of the earliest sections of the zohar is a as a text called the midrash anailam uh, the hidden midrash that section is written mostly in, in hebrew uh mostly in hebrew there's a little aramaic in there and if you want to kind of get zohar training wheels reading zohar and kind of getting used to the way how zohar works that's the section i would start with first um because once you kind of get to how the Zohar thinks and how it writes in Hebrew, um, th then you could jump to other texts like the Yanuka, which is very narrative, right? It's not like the Sifra de Tzniuta or some crazy right. text like that. Right. This is much more narrative. And once you kind of get that, then you can begin picking up the weird idiom of, uh, of uh, the Zohar. Also, studying the Yerushalmi, that's the closest Aramaic to this text, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I would also say for the Hebrew Hebrew speakers and readers out there, I mean, there's a classic Hebrew like uh, interpolated commentary in the Zohar, the Matok Midvash, yeah. sweeter than honey, and that's a classic for anyone uh, that um, that that can follow along in the Hebrew, and he and he does a good job translating and explaining. Not not that much explanation, but but just a you know at least translating. Yeah. And also, if you get if you're a Hebrew reader, what I'd recommend getting is a version like this one. This is the one that I have. Um, that uh, it has the Zohar uh, Manukad, so you can read in the Aramaic with the mm -hmm. vowels, but also has a, a, a like a in Lashon Kodesh has a, a Hebrew translation right there. So if you get lost in the Aramaic, typically you can jump over to the Hebrew and you're like, um, it will be a bit clearer. Um, yeah. So that's another way, because I think I mean you have to really be on your Zohar chops to read the straight Aramaic. Like you have to. That's. It's beyond me. I, I can't do that. I have to have a lot of, um, I have to have, definitely have training wheels, um, so, both intellectually and linguistically. Certainly. Um, it's an interesting question, I guess. We could, uh, uh, do all Jewish honor Kabbalah? I guess Jews, um, most do. There are very few Jewish sects out there that are anti Kabbalah these days, huh? Um, I mean, certainly historically there have been those who didn't right. who didn't vibe with Kabbalah. Um, there there are there are some there are some camps today um, that that uh, that don't have don't have love for Kabbalah, and I think uh, sort of on both sides of the religious spectrum, both in more liberal circles and in more orthodox circles. But it's it's more and more of a fringe position. Uh, ever since like the 16th century onwards, you know, there's a famous um, um, Ari, no Ari Nochem, which is this uh, this attack on Kabbalah, and and there are some contemporary um, Rambamists, you know, these Maimonideans who who have kept up that um, that that animosity towards Kabbalah. Um, there's a misunderstanding that 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 which assumes that the that the that the Misnagdic movement was anti-Kabbalah. They weren't. They were they were great great Kabbalists. They were they were they were against the way that it was being disseminated, um, but but there are camps there are there are groups here and there, 
who don't who uh, who aren't fans of Kabbalah, but but a you know a small minority. Yeah, I think it's I think it's, I mean, and also like there's you know it kind of. I will say that it's it is interesting to me, and it's a thing that I um, that I I've noticed like in the, in the more liberal world is just like Kabbalah kind of textual ignorance. Like it's only in the liberal Jewish world that the Zohar isn't canon in some level. Like that's always struck me as, and there's a reason for that. It has to do with the 19th century uh, Wissenschaftlich Judentums movement. But it's just interesting that Zohar isn't just sort of one of the things that people would do a drosh on and like a recon. Uh, surely I was talking to my, my, my partner, who's a rabbi. She went through uh, from Hebrew college and it was interesting. I was asking her like, you know, in the five years you were there, was Kabbalah ever a thing that you had to take? Like you had to take Gemara, but did you ever have to take Zohar? And she's like, no, most places like, uh, you know, uh, it's totally optional. Yeah. I, I would say as well that, that in many circles, even, even in more Orthodox circles, Kabbalah, uh, and the Zohar is more revered than it is read. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be canonized and, and held up <clears throat> at a very <clears throat> at a very supreme place conceptually, but that doesn't mean necessarily that um, it's going to be engaged with um, and and certainly not directly. That's that's uh, uh, to find direct engagement with Kabbalah, you need to be going to certain specific um, Sephardi communities or certain Hasidic communities, not even all of them. Um, the ideas will certainly be permeating, but, but direct, I mean, I studied to be, I don't like talking about this publicly, but I studied to be an Orthodox rabbi and we didn't have to learn any Kabbalah for that. We didn't have to learn any Zara for that either. So Alana and I are in the same boat as far as that goes. Is this is, is, do you know if on the Rabbi Newt test in, in, in Israel, or is there any Kabbalah questions on there at all? No, 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 not at all. No. Yeah. The, so it's the, just the, like. The, t the test, the, yeah, it's like it's all yeah. it's all Shulchan Aruch. It's all it's yeah. all base Yosef, like Rama Nesa Kalim. It's all it's all like it's all it's all halacha. It's all Jewish law, isn't it? Right. Is, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised, and that's uh, uh, that's interesting. Also, point out that uh, uh, congregant and, and leader of our community here at Congregation Tachia, uh, Jake, is is in the chat. Um, but yeah, uh, but art, the art. I think art is no longer at at Hebrew College. Uh, I mean, Chassi Dude, I think, had some place at Hebrew College because of art, and that's you know that has Kabbalah baked in, but right, like uh, 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 not really. That's but what I'm saying. Like it will it will filter through, but 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 you're not going to find a sh like a, a sheer. You're not going to find a class where there is actually being gone through and read as we're doing here, for example. Right. So, would you recommend to start with Yehuda Ashlag and Michael Leitman commentary on the Zohar to start with? I think, um, I mean, uh, I guess I'll say what I, I'll say. Like, I, I think Yehud Ashlag is really interesting. Um, don't read him in English because there are lots of translations of the Baal Sulam, the Yehud Ashlag, but they're just like Hebrewish. Every other word is just like technical Hebrew word from Kabbalah. And so it's just like, you might as well just learn to read Hebrew if you're going to read it. Also, um, this is, I'll just lay it out there. I don't like Lurianic Kabbalah. I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't like it. I, I like, I'm not a Kabbalist, but I just don't like Lurianic. I don't, I just don't like it. I'm much more on the fan of Cordovero. And I find that Lurianic Kabbalists, like they, they work so hard to shove the Zohar into a Lurianic frame framework that when you read Lurianists on Zohar, I think you're not reading the Zohar. I think you're getting a very distorted, vision of what's going on in the text and i'm not trying to say like i'm a zohar only person but i i think that it's better to have gotten a grasp of what's going on in the text first before you read someone who's going to shove it into like an ashlagi and, and, and again cordovera does the same thing i'm not saying he doesn't but i think he's saying much closer to the spirit of the zohar than Luria does that was so, I, yeah. i'm gonna get zohar canceled i'm gonna get kabbalah canceled now but <laughs> uh you can't be but whatever like uh, that was so it, funny, Justin. Oh my god! But I, I just don't like it. I don't like even Sarug, Israel Sarug, Sarugian uptake, which is much less baroque than uh, Chaim Vital's uptake of the Arizal. I just don't like it. No, that was funny because I thought you were gonna go after uh, Lightman or Ashlag, but you just went right after the Ari. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd be, I mean, I'd be careful when I say stuff like this. That trouble. was so funny. I, that was so you caught now that caught me so unexpectedly. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I know I've heard you say this before, but <laughs> um, in the context of a question of of of, of Lightman and Arsenal, it's hilarious. Yeah. Have, uh, you read, I, have you read? Have you read much of the Ball Slum? I haven't read Michael Lightman's commentary, but I've I've spent time with the with the you hit Ashlag. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no comment here. It's not it's not my uh not 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 within my not it's not within my tradition, let's say. Okay. Yeah, that's a great that's a great dodge. <laughs> <laughs> Yehuda Ashlag is interesting. I mean, just to like his politics, like his the weird communism that he invented. Right. Like the spiritual communism that he invented, that sort of like Kabbalistic communism is like Kabbalism. It's really it's fascinating. Um I, I get, yeah, yeah. I get. I have to. I have to figure out what to answer to this question because I get it every once in a while, you know, from from people through the channel, of like modern Kabbalah teachers, and and I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put Lightman and Ashlag in the same in the same. Anyhow, I, I I'm not, I'm not going to say anything for now until I figure out what to say. <laughs> yeah, that's why I just went straight to the Arizal. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can just complain. Yeah, about, I can just savage. complain about him. Savage. Um. Whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, I do. I do wish that uh, no one's Loria... going to see you for complaining about Luria, basically. <laughs> Someone in the uh, spot is going to get my you know, can do the uh, de Nour on me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna really die on this court of Aaron Hill. I'm gonna become like an the the court of Aaron uh, standard bearer. Um, Have you made? You you made did you make some content on Cardivera? Just the, on his uh I've not I want to make one on the Toma Devora, but just on the his guide to studying um Right, right, right. His guide to studying Kabbalah, which is is fascinating. Um because there's that great line where he st- talks about studying Zohar on Esther, which doesn't exist or didn't hmm. doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. Um No, but we need no we need a full on some one someone someone in this in this circle needs to make a full on like expo exposition of his thought. That's I mean if we're gonna you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna be fans of him, we may as well. Yeah, I need to do something. Yeah, it's, it's hard though. Part of translation yeah, yeah, yeah. Is text. Yeah. And Oriachar is not even fully translated, I don't think yet. Like his commentary on the Zohar is yeah. like twenty three yeah. volumes long, some crazy it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's even totally done yet. There's been yeah, there's been there's been there's been a there's been a I wouldn't say a bunch of scholarship. There's been a, there's been a bit of scholarship. I think I think I think we were chatting about this sometime before myself, uh, you myself, and uh, and and Philip about about what scholarship has been done and if we could do a video on him or something. But one yeah. of these days, God willing. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's a. He deserves it. He definitely does. Definitely does. Yeah. Uh, and also, the Toma Devora would be a great text to do because it's so accessible and it's like practical Kabbalah in the sense of like here's how to make this sort of uh, way you live. So it's very yeah. nice. It's a it's a very approachable text in that way. I would say though, anyone that's anyone that's looking for. Kabbalah as what they think of Kabbalah is not going to be very, they're not going to be excited. They're yes. not going to find it in the text, basically. Right. Just be orthodox. Be from, it's, there you go. It's, it's much more of like a, a Musser text. It's much more of like an ethical. Yeah. But yeah, someone's asking about the Orchard of Promagans. Yep. That's the text that we were talking about. That. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've worked through chunks of it in Hebrew because I don't think it's totally translated in English. And I've worked through chunks in Hebrew and it's tough. The it's parties. Tough. It's also, it's also an encyclopedia. It's not a book, yeah. right? Right. Yep. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's, it's not a, not an easy text. Uh, also I've had people, uh, repeatedly ask me to do a, a, uh, an episode on the Tanya. So Zevi, I'm putting that to you. <laughs> it's so hard to do books that are close to home. It's so hard. It's yeah. not fair. I can't do them. I'll, I'll do, you do Tanya and I'll do, I'll do, um, um, Judaism as Judaism as a civilization. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, that that would be a funny uh, funny mashup. Uh, yeah. But the Tanya is also hard because it's not one book. It's like, it's, it's a very it's a very difficult text. It's a text that I've struggled with my whole life. It's not I couldn't I it's it's, it's it will be it will be a long time before I feel before, yeah yeah yeah. Well, yeah, it'd be funny to do a text on uh, Judaism of civilization, the least seekers of unity content ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do like that it was burned. Like they literally, they like, like, um, they like Orthodox rabbis brought it into the, the head of the Yiddish radio channel in New York and like burned it it on live radio. 
Yeah, yeah, and they like they, they like alive. There was a live excommunication. A- a- ASMR, a book bunny. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something about, and also like when they did, I think they did it in like the, whatever the forties. It was like just the most tone deaf thing to do. Uh, uh, yeah, like come on, guys. Like, are you not in the world? Uh, my big, my big. Um, having said that, my big regret of of having only produced video content this time, this you know, until now. Is that no one can bone a video? It's, it's it makes me very sad that you know. <laughs> you still get excommunicated for it though. Yeah, but I want. I, I'm a tactile person. I'd, I'd yeah. like. A, I'd like a. I'd like to be. <laughs> yeah. um, God forbid. No one, should, no one should burn books. God forbid. No one should. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 you know what is it? Uh, is it Rilke said? Those that, really, those that burn books. Yeah, those that burn books will eventually burn people. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. Do. Jojo asked about the, uh, the the index prohibitorum. I'm actually making an episode, um, probably not next week, but maybe the week after on the Inquisition. I'm going to do an episode on the mm. like the foundation of the Inquisition, and I'll well, talk uh, about the about the index. Wow. Um, I'll talk about the index. It's a cool book to get, by the way. You can get copies of the index from the 18th century for like 50 bucks, and it'll like you can see like Spinoza and Descartes and all their names are in it. That's cool. That's um, super cool. It's a cool. It's it's a cool book to earn. Uh, to, it's a cool book to have. To look at all the banned books, then so now you basically have a reading list. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good way of putting it. So it's uh, any any book that was on the index is probably worthy of reading. You know that uh, Pico della Miranda was the first person the on the first, index. Yes, the first one to be. I was. You know, it's so funny you say that. In my mind, I knew that I had a name, and I and I'd actually <laughs> mentioned it in a previous episode. And I'm like, who who was it that I said? And it was Pico. Yeah, yeah. yeah Pico was the first person. Rich, on the index. It was the, the it was the it was the oration, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. yep, you 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 pulled that thought right out of my right out of my head. So that's a funny, funny, a funny claim to fame that uh, that 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 he could take. All right, folks. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, we're what at two eighty four. We have ten pages left, I think. Twelve pages left, and in, um, in the mat, probably two dapim left in Aramaic. Like the way we're going, the pay we're going, but we're um, we're going to keep on keeping on next Thursday, I guess. So more Yanuka next time, but. And folks, thank you again for hanging out with us, and uh, we'll do some more Zohar with all of y'all next time. Good to be here.